Okay, Sarah and then Jim. Oh, Sarah. It spares the creases. It spares the creases, is that what you said? Yeah. Did I hear it right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then I said if it involves the creases, it's candida. Right. So you can have a dermatitis with, and you can, then you can have a super infection on it. It can be fungal or uh, bacterial. What else did you learn? What did you learn about diapers? Change them. Change them. Okay, yes. So frequently change them. Um, keep them dry as much as possible. Keep them dry as possible. Okay, what else? She recommended using a protective barrier to help keep them dry. Did you talk about which kind? Okay, then we'll just move through this because it sounds like you have. So, you know, if you have a new mom and she has no family around, it may be that you need to be instructive about diaper changing because <coughs> diapers are so, uh, can, are so absorbent, sometimes it's hard to tell if they're dry or not. So some of the newer uh, diapers have a wetness indicator, which will help you. Um, so, and then looking at the, the type of diapers, cheaper diapers can work sometimes. They may not work as well as some of the other products, so it may be a change of diapers. Uh, it, do you have Dr. Britton again? It, uh, does he teach anymore? In geriatrics. Geriatrics. Okay. This will work for geriatrics as well. You'll have to tell, have him tell you because he loves to tell this story because he, he really... Uh, so, on <laughs> May, so Cameron was born in January and Easter my brother and his wife came out and Camera was probably three and a half or four months old, and he had the most biggest explosive diaper <laughs> in the world. You know when you're, no, the moms will recognize this, you know when you're, you're getting up to just the pound limit of the diaper, if you don't go on up to the bigger diaper, if they have a big hoop, it just goes everywhere, up the back, out the legs, everywhere. So that's what happened to, to us. So, but he loves to tell the story and he embellishes it. <laughs> so you should. Well, I'll make you tell it to you when you get there. Okay. So the diaper dermatitis. This is one that has a superimposed candida on top of it. Uh, in terms of skin care, frequent changing, cleaning. Uh, if the if you have um, moms who continue to complain about irritation then have them look at the type of wipes they're using. Uh, I gave you one of the preservatives down there under the skin care, the last bullet. Look for that in the, um, in the ingredients, that methyl isothiazolinone uh, is known to cause an allergic contact dermatitis. Uh, so warm, you know, warm water, um, fragrance free, alcohol free, you can buy all of those um, over the in the baby section. Okay, so then my contribution, and keep those butts dry. Keep them um, air them out. Use, you can use, did you talk about using a, a hair dryer on low, low speed? That's really good. If you're really having problems getting the, uh, with recurrent diaper rashes, you just get the hair dryer up on the lowest speed and dry them out. Okay. Then we'll look at how diapers are constructed. This guy is hysterical. He was an engineer, and he is really funny. He's entertaining, but also educated. The engineering oh, no, why show up modern disposable candle dispenser. It's a triumph of polymer science. Yeah, like candle <laughs> Story. It's brilliant engineering lies in the creation of interlinked mechanisms that 
operate at different time scales. Can you hear in this it? urine mm -hmm. from the baby's skin and distribute it through the bag is super absorbent, which traps the urine. Let's work our way from the outside in. The outermost layer is a thin, soft cover, almost impossible to remove in one piece. It's there for the parent's comfort. It feels like cloth, but it's made from plastic. The next layer is a barrier sheet. Typically, it's polyethylene, the same stuff we use in plastic grocery bags. This plastic barrier is there to contain feces. Along the diaper's edges are elasticized leg cuffs, which is noted in one of the many patents help contain explosive liquid <laughs> <laughs> So, containing solids is simple, but where the diaper itself, where its engineering astonishes me, is its handling of the urine. To sweep it away from the baby's skin and to keep it away is the task of the diaper's three inner layers. The top sheet rests on the child's skin. Bonded to it is the surge layer, called in the industry the acquisition distribution layer. And then the absorbent core. A cross section of the diaper shows the relative thickness of these three inner layers. The top sheet is very thin, the surge layer a little thicker, and the absorbent core the thickest. Each has a different function. The top sheet's behavior surprises me. Most liquid goes right through the mesh, but when I gently place a drop of liquid in the top sheet, it beads up. I've been able to get it to stay there six hours. I expect the top sheet to be highly absorbent to soak up water. But the fibers in the top sheet, if are touching the child's skin, repel water. Well, at first, counterintuitive, this action is central to keeping a child dry. Urine passes through the holes of the top sheet, which is made from polypropylene, because it strikes the top sheet at over six miles per hour. Once through the top sheet, it's water apples to prevent the stagnant cold or evacuated urine from flowing back onto the child's skin. As I insult the diaper, the liquid passes through the top sheet and enters the surge layer, which swells rapidly. Watch as that layer distributes this localized insult throughout the length of the diaper. As the surge layer empties, the absorbent core swells. To whisk the liquid from the top sheet to the absorbent core, the surge layer uses capillary action. You can see that with this device. As I fill it, the blue liquid climbs up each of the capillary tubes. Most absorbent material uses this action. For example, the threads of a washcloth form channels throughout the fabric. A capillary action liquid climbs into these channels. No, it isn't the fibers that absorb the liquid, but the spaces or channels between the fibers. In an absorptive material, the size of the channels determine how much liquid is moved and how fast. Notice here that the smallest diameter tube moves liquid farther than the largest diameter tube, but of course, the smaller tube moves a smaller volume of liquid. The channels in the surge layer arranged like these four tubes. Near the baby skin, the surge layer has large channels. This moves a lot of liquid quickly, fast uptake, and then further from the skin, a more dense network of fibers, which creates smaller diameter channels. Not only does this arrangement of channels whisk the urine away, it also works like a one-way valve to prevent urine from flowing back toward the baby's skin. You would think that something this absorbent would be woven like cloth, but to weave a fabric, Varying channel size would be extraordinarily difficult and expensive. Instead, to construct the surge layer, diaper companies use non-wovens. In a woven fabric, the strains are carefully interlaced, but in a non-woven, polymer fibers are suspended in air and then deposited in a moving belt where the warm fibers adhere to each other. It's a lot like making cotton candy. There, the fibers met together in something that resembles cloth, but clearly is a woven. As the urine leaves the surge layer, and enters the absorbent core, which stores the urine in the diaper is disposed. It must hold urine for up to nine hours or so as the child sleeps. A number four size diaper can hold about 400 milliliters of urine. The urine is trapped in a super absorbent polymer. Here I have five or six grams of that polymer. I'll mix it with 160 or so grams of water. As the polymer absorbs the water, it swells and turns into a gel. And it's super absorbent and truly amazing things. This bag contains hundreds of small spheres, which four millimeters in diameter, made of a super absorbent polymer similar to what's in diapers. Watch what happens as a single sphere in a wash glass and cover it with colored water. Over four hours, it soaks up the water and grows. The super absorbent contains long polymer chains chains of carbon molecules that create channels like the fibers in a washcloth. 
These channels between the polymer chains absorb the water by capillary action. The water also sticks to the superabsorbent. The chains are designed to chemically attract water. It forms the sphere because the polymer chains are attached to each other. It's called crosslinking. As the polymer attracts water here, the water, so to speak, becomes caught in a net of polymer. The superabsorbent turns into a gel and traps the water and urine in the case of the diaper. In fact, I can roll the sphere around in my hand and it still holds water, even though it's some 99% water and 1% polymer. Superabsorbent is so effective that when it forms a gel with the urine, it can block the flow of urine to unused parts of the absorbent form. So in many diaper brands, it's mixed throughout 15% or so of cotton, which provides channels for water to reach the unused superabsorbent. The details I've shared with you about how a diaper works astonish me. But equally stunning is the speed at which this precision object is made. Diaper lines produce about a thousand diapers a minute. You'll likely never see one in person. The way each manufacturer designs their apparatus to move a flappy object like a diaper at many miles per hour is a tightly held trade secret. I'm no happy. <laughs> Wasn't that worth coming to class for? Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's what we must be what inspired the That's engineers to do. Exactly. <laughs> you just swallow it. Oh. So we've had. Of course, I have boys so they like bust their diapers or have bust them yeah. and that does little balls just go everywhere. <laughs> it's just little balls of bees. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't really want to close it up, so. Just another reason to see you. Yeah, that's why I need to have it instantly. <laughs> fix all the problems. Sure. And I'll get to clean more, which, you know, is therapeutic. Yeah. <laughs> but you'll be cleaning them here. So it's like double thumb. Yeah, yeah. Okay, like so if you have moms who are using cloth diapers, and they're still having problems with uh, diaper rat or diaper dermatitis, going to a uh, one of those uh, disposables for a while and then coming back is a reasonable uh, alternative. I love disposable diapers. They came out, my sister, youngest sister was born in 67, something like that, or 70. And that was when Pampers first came out. And at my mother's shower, they gave her these disposable diapers. We also had cloth, but I, after dealing with cloth, I, I was the one that had to dunk them in the toilet. Yep. Gross. They didn't have diaper services back then. So I, I have great respect for them. So it's the only place I, I'm like, to the green people, I'm sorry, but I'm glad I used disposable diapers. Okay, so barrier preps. Um, so she talked about all of these. So these are going to, just like we talked about ointments, they are going to protect, they're protective. Um, so any of those would work. Um, and they, you want them to go on first. You want to get it, the, the uh, bottom dry and then um, place them on. Okay, so topical steroids, do we use those? You can use the lowest potency, which is which one? Hydrocortisone, so that is, uh, That is reasonable. They do make combination products that are often used for diaper dermatitis, but they usually uh, involve uh, higher potency products like um, beta, uh, beta methasone. So it's recommended don't use those combination products like Mycolog 2. We used to use that a lot for the, the bottles. Uh, so use separate products um, and use that lowest dose for the shortest length of time. Did you go over the antifungals to use? Okay, the next page, I don't know what page it is. Thirteen. So these, you have heard these before, nystatin, trimazole, myconazole. We talked about these for vaginal candidiasis, so they're going to work on the baby bone too. Uh, so these can be used uh, if you've got a candida infection. The other is that some mothers will use breast milk. Did she talk about that? No. Breast milk is thought to be anti-inflammatory. Uh, 
I just remembered when I was Googling how to deal with uh, nipple irritation at first, a lot of people yep. say use breast milk here yep. too. Yeah, you like can, yes, milk. you sure can. Um, so if moms are opposed to doing the other uh, agents and they have, you got, you're dealing with a mild um, dermatitis, you can use breast milk. Because we remember we talked about it having antimicrobial activity, right? Uh, harmful products. Don't use baking soda, talcum powder. Did you all talk about that? You aerosolize it, baby breathes it in, they get respiratory difficulties from it. So they don't recommend putting talcum powder anymore. Um, you all, we talked about avoid fragrance-free preservatives, allergens. Products that have boric acid, they're very toxic to kids. Phenol, benzocaine, salicylates, don't use them because they can get absorbed and cause systemic toxicity. But they are in some agents for diaper dermatitis that they can buy over the counter. So if a mom comes in, she said, I just can't get this to clear up, seems to get worse. Have them bring in what they're using. Look at the ingredients. Uh, if you're not sure what they are, call your pharmacist or Google them and see what they are. And, or get out your handout and compare. Okay, so you all talked about um, topical preps. Um, we talked about the Canada. Just make sure I covered her. Bacterial super infections. Did you talk about that? What page is that? Kathleen? Okay, fourteen. So here it's usually staph. So you could use something like Cupiricin. It comes generic now. Bacterban was the uh, brand name. Oral usually aren't in needle. But there's one to avoid. So neosporin is over the counter, right? So neosporin is an aminoglycoside. What do you remember about aminoglycosides? Ototoxic. So if you're putting it on inflamed, broken material, what do we know about the absorption through those kinds of skins? It increases. So if you're using too much, you can get enough of that neomycin uh, systemically to affect the ears. So tell your moms to avoid those. Don't use them. You don't prescribe them. Refractory diaper uh, dermatitis. Let me draw your attention to this because I think it's important for you to think about other things. So if everything's been done, the mom seems to know what she's doing, uh, or you suspect child abuse or neglect, that might be something to keep in mind. But for the diseases, think about type 1 diabetes. Uh, usually type 1 sh can start to show up after six months. Okay? Mom's immune system effects are usually the baby's immune system should start picking up. There is a type of diabetes called neonatal diabetes in type 1, and it occurs right after birth. It is a separate category. Uh, but this is one where type 1 can actually start to show up. So if they're having lots of diapers, let's say they're complaining about babies going through a lot of diapers, that could be um, uh, the issue. An underlying immune deficiency. So look for other causes when you have when you get down to the point where nothing seems to be working. Talk about type of diaper. Uh, overzealous moms. So you can overclean, just like we talked about overcleaning ourselves. Um, on the next page, so dried feces, not maybe not uh, maybe somewhat neglected. Use think mineral oil to remove to keep the skin because those are really tender skins uh, that can be damaged. So mineral oil can be done. Same thing we talk about: uh, patting dry, not rubbing dry. So moms may get overzealous about drying that butt so that the dermatitis doesn't come back. But going through just basic. Um, cleanliness rules would, would be important. Okay. Did that add anything to what you knew? Now you know about diapers. You didn't know it before you came in, and now you do. All right. Let's talk about seborrheic dermatitis. So, what did you learn about seborrhea? Increased sebum, sebum production. What's the mildest form usually that a lot of people have? Dandruff. Okay. 
So where does seborrhea usually show up? Hair, eyebrows, folds, nose. Okay, so a lot of head. Can it go on the rest of the body? So hair and male, mustache. Okay, all right. So the big things are erythema, right, scales, and puritis. We all hit all the big places. So approach to treatment. So our mainstay or antifungal approach or an antifungal shampoo or a, a, like a tar shampoo. So those uh, tar shampoos we looked at yesterday like tea gel. Uh, that Neutrogena makes. It's a really good one. Selenium uh, is a really good one. So Celsin Blue uh, would be uh, one that would fit in that ca category. Uh, those are ones that they can buy over the counter. Uh, the Ketoconazole or the uh, Loprox are ones that you would have to write a prescription for. The big thing here is to get them to leave it on the head long enough. So get in the shower, soak that up, leave it on, take care of the rest of your body. Um, and then come back and then rinse it off. So if they can leave it on for five to 10 minutes, that would be great. It's contact time that will uh, make the difference. Uh, with most of these, they can do it once, they can do it daily until it starts to improve and then they can back off to whatever point or whatever frequency will keep the, uh, them from relapsing. Biggest complaint would be irritation early on. You ever used a Celsa Blue or a tea gel? It burns. Uh, it has a slight stinging. It's not that irritating, but it, it certainly is noticeable. Some will complain of drying the hair out, and it will. Uh, so if they can move to, if you can move them quickly, uh, or if you can use other products to get the, the process arrested, and then move them to uh, more intermittent, then they can use another a shampoo in the uh, meantime. Or, since there are a variety of different types of shampoos that will work, have them move to a different product. And you'll find that over time they'll complain about it doesn't seem to be working as much anymore. Have them move to another product. You can use the high potency uh, topical steroids. Remember the, the foams that we talked about? Those are a good place to use them because they'll get down on the skin. Lotions would be another uh, vehicle to use. So dandruff, mild as foreign, just to use an anti-dandruff shampoo. Any of them, any of them can be used, whatever they want. Start with Celsa Blue, use a, the tea gel, either any of those. A salic salicylic acid product would also work. Keratolytic takes off those plaques. What about seborrheic dermatitis on the face? Okay, so here, the lowest potency steroid, Again, once or twice a day until you've got it arrested, hopefully in a couple of weeks, and then you back off. If you keep using it, what's the side effect? What happens to the skin? Hypopigmentation, or you can get the skin atrophy. An alternative is you can use antifungal creams or solutions instead. If you use those mild steroids for long periods of time, because this will never go away, they'll have to keep using a product in order for it to uh, stay in remission, is you can get those telangiectasias and other skin changes due to the steroids. So keep that in mind. Remember, the skin is really vulnerable on the face. What do you do with men who have mustaches and beards? Here, that ketoconazole, uh, uh, Nizarel is the brand name, is really good. Also having them keep it clean, keeping it uh, cut. Paul, you wear, you wear a mustache and beard all the time. Any problems? I mean, have you having to deal with that over time? Mm -hmm. Okay, too young. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. Um, so again, a low potency steroid could be used or those topical calcineurin inhibitors. So tachromalus, tachromalus could also be used. Remember with them, it's slower onset. So they might be good if you use other products to get the, the um, uh, seborrhea under control and then switch them to those uh, agents. 
On the trunk, uh, you can use a little bit higher potency, the skin can uh, take it. Um, and again, it's the once or twice a day until symptoms decide, move them to a different product. Um, again, antifungals. So think, you see the progression, it just repeats itself. <coughs> it's the same kind of thing we talked about. Remission, induce it, then put them on intermittent therapy or move them to a non-steroidal, if you can, non-steroidal product. <coughs> Most of those are tolerated really well, especially the antifungal. Okay, anything in about Severia? The biggest thing is what I find is I see a lot of physicians do, or providers, I shouldn't say they were all physicians, but it just gets ignored. You know, as people get older, we just kind of accept that they look a certain way. This is my take on it. And people just don't address it. Or you've got them coming in for acute problems that have got to be addressed. So, and sometimes it takes a long time to get people into a dermatitis, or to a dermatologist. So addressing these things, I think it just helps self-image. They're itchy. Uh, they, they probably don't cause them a great deal of discomfort, but they could, especially when they get really heavy in the eyebrows for older men and in between their, um, their eyebrows and along that hairline. So you know how to take care of it. Address it. It's pretty easy to, to do. Prevention of relapse, intermittent use we talked about long term. So having, getting the patient to commit and to go with something that they can maintain long term is the will help in terms of adherence. Okay. Tinea capitis. Is that your next one? Okay. What did you learn about it? This is a tough one. It's fungus. Cradle cap, right? They call it uh, cradle cap is baby, so this is um, this is tinea of the of the hip, right? So a fungal infection of the head. How does it usually present? Pardon, what did you say? Uh, I just couldn't hear you. What you want to say? What else? What I always think the kids' heads look moth right? You get a little patchy alopecia, right? Mm -hmm. So they get plaques, so if they've got thick hair, it might be hard to see at first. Hair loss, okay, so if you treat them, it'll come back, but they'll lose, they'll lose hair. They get little patchy areas, you can start making fun of them. This is the moth eaten that I always think about. They can itch, this is a little one. Here's another one where you've got multiple scaly patches all over the scalp. Here's another one. See the black dots? Hard to see. This is where hair is broken off at the shaft. So you have just those little pinpoint remnants of, of hair. So if you treat it, it'll grow back in. So patchy alopecia, scaly, itchy plaques. So you have to use an antifungal. So here we almost always use an oral antifungal. We will use an oral antifungal. So the, the two drugs that are most commonly used are greasiofulvin or terbenafine. Greasiofulvin is the one that most people go to, except a lot, I think a lot of people also will move to terbenafine. So greasiofulvin, the things to keep in mind with these drugs is that it's liver. Remember with the other, the azoles, the, uh, they, it's liver. So you need liver baseline for a lot of these. It's also a long-term therapy, it, it, like 6 to 12 weeks. So that may be long for a kid uh, or for, uh, well, not maybe so much for an adult, but... So with the greasy effulvent, the, the things to think about it is that you've got to have fatty foods, you've got to take it with fatty foods to enhance absorption. One of the things they've done is they've made these, they've cut down particle sizes. So you've got ultra micro you've got micro -sized. And those are to enhance absorption. 
They come as granules for kids that can be mixed in with food, because that's usually who's going to have this. Uh, or they make a suspension. Uh, so there's a variety of dosage forms that are available for these, uh, those two agents. What's the, what's the bug that's causing your the organism? It's one of the, the trichophytons as a class are the ones that usually cause it. And then you got that fur fur or whatever it is. Okay, so du treatment duration of Rhesia fulvin, 12 weeks. Use, give it with fatty foods. So it's really highly dependent on getting it absorbed. So bioavailability is a problem if you do not uh, give it with a higher fat. So upset stomach is the biggest problem, most common problem. But look at the serious side effects. Hepatotoxicity, granulocytopenia, leukopenia, severe cutaneous reactions. So you can get dress syndrome. What is dress? Say it loud. Syndrome, right. So it's severe. We saw it with Geodon. We saw it with uh, some of the antipsychotic, other antipsychotics. Not very common, but when it is, it's one of those type 4 hypersensitivity. Bad news. What else is in that type 4 group? Stephen Johnson? 10. 10. So for this, for Grisia fulvin, uh, they recommend not, you don't have to get liver en uh, en enzymes before, usually you're dealing with kids, but if you're going to do a therapy beyond eight weeks, they recommend getting the liver enzymes and uh, uh, doing a CBC. So for terbenafine, uh, it also comes as granules, tablets uh, that you can uh, sprinkle on. Both of these are weight based. For kids, and I think in your prescriptions, I took out of the package insert. I took the weight-based uh, recommendations. I gave you a weight of the kid, and you have to figure out what uh, dose they need. So duration with terbinafine is four to six weeks. So that's why some people prefer it over the greasy fulvin. Look at the severe side effects under there. You see dress again, Stephen Johnson, so those hypersensitivity reactions, pancreatitis, drug-induced lupus. So usually in short term, they're going to do fine. Alternative, other antifungals can be used orally. They are probably as effective, but the data behind them is just their experience, published experience data is not as much. Grisia fulvin has the most, that's why it's number one, followed by terbinafine. Okay. Adjunct is you can use the antifungal uh, shampoos with them. The other big thing with this is that you have to treat everybody in the house. Did you all talk about that? So as soon as some, if somebody in the household is diagnosed, even if the, the, they may be asymptomatic, but they may be carriers or reserve, uh, reservoirs of the uh, bug. So they all need to start on an antifungal shampoo. The other then is that you need to separate out what they've got, you know, like pillowcases, hair care products. Uh, should be separated. Furniture that they've been on direct contact, especially if you're dealing with cloth uh, furniture. Pets can be a reservoir here, so uh, it may be that they need to be checked out by a vet if it's a continual problem. You know, kids bury their head. Dr. Britton buries his head. <laughs> Schultz's uh, side all the time. So kids do too. So that direct contact is usually uh, transferring it. This one, if they take the drug and you give it for adequate amount of time, it's going to clear up. But you need to do a follow-up. You need to see them. You need to be, have a, an alert in that family because they're all at high risk for getting it. Uh, so treating them uh, quickly will uh, take care of the problem. And rates of reinfection can be also, uh, you can use antifungal shampoos as a, as a means of prevention.
Anything in addition that you've heard? Okay, atopic dermatitis. You will see a lot of this. Eczema. If you look back on at the beginning of this section, uh, where do I put that? Hold on. Okay. Look back at the beginning of seborrheic dermatitis. Somebody tell me a page when you get there. 18, 15. 15. Look at the top there. So people will use eczema and dermatitis interchangeably. So eczema used alone is usually referring to atopic dermatitis, which is what we're just going to talk about. Eczematous changes mean scaling, crusting, oozing, like we talked with um, Seborrheic dermatitis also can, has that same appearance. Dermatitis usually has qualifiers, so contact dermatitis, seborrheic dermatitis, okay? So just to, for nuance, but people tend to use them back and forth as the same. Did y'all talk about atopic, uh, atopic dermatitis? So this is an allergic dermatitis, right? So chronic, pyritic, inflammatory skin disease. I see a lot in hand washers, uh, mostly I saw it on hands. Uh, so exacerbating factors, excessive bathing. So people have got their hands in water all the time. I would uh, tend to get it when I, because in the clinic I was washing my hands all the time. Uh, and so I would, because I wash it going in, wash it going out, if I did a finger stick I did before and after. And so I tended to have problems when I was always using like a soap and water uh, tended to start to um, aggravate it. Um, emotional stress, overheating of the skin, exposure to solvents, detergents, that hand washing. Uh, avoiding things that tend to uh, respond and, and induce itch uh, are helpful. So let's look at uh, the bottom of that page. So maintaining skin hydration. So just like we talked in, in yesterday, uh, using lotion. Uh, so a lot of, uh, like our clinic eventually went to where we had soap that has uh, those dispensers that also had soap and a, an emollient in it. Um, or what we did before that is we just put them right beside the soap dispenser in the bathrooms and in the, uh, in the clinic areas as well. Remember that lotions, remember your vehicles that are highly, are more evaporated. So those that have a higher water kit can, can make them worse. So the proper choice of an emollient can make a big difference in terms of helping with that drying of skin. So the Eucerin, the uh, Cetaphil, Nutriderm is one I didn't show you, but it's also in that group. Um, the ointments, the, petri the uh, jelly, the Vaseline, the Aquaphor, those might be better at night. Um, I used to put that on at night and I'd cut the fingers. I can't stand the enclosed toes or, or fingers, so I would just cut the fingertips off of the gloves and then I could stand it. And that keeps that uh, moisture in all night. So that, was, that helped me in terms of skin hydration. Tell them to do it frequently. If they can reduce the amount of water or the type of detergent they're using, that will help as well. Pyritis is a big problem. Um, so all the things we've talked about in the past uh, can help. So antihistamines can be used. The non-sedating will work as well as the, uh, as the sedating. Those topical calcineurin uh, products can also help. Uh, so that tachromalus and chromalus. So those can also be helpful. Water temperature, we talked about that. The cooler the temperature, usually the less aggravating it is. Uh, using those astringents, uh, like Domboro, uh, when they are able to do that, will be very soothing. Uh, the emollients we talked about, dressings overnight, um, the phenol, the menthol, and the camphor. Uh, those would need to be added products to, or added ingredients to an emollient that they were using. 
Patients with mild to moderate disease, you can use a corticosteroid. You're going to use it based on the location uh, in terms of the potency. You can use those topical calcineurin inhibitors as well. Uh, let's see, the elongates. Nothing else new there. Uh, moderate disease. Let's see if there's anything there. Same kind of, same approach. Change in potency, change in maybe using multiple products. The other is with kids. Remember the uh, not using those um, calcineurin inhibitors in kids younger than two. Avoiding relapse, same principle all over again. Get them into remission and keep them there, either through intermittent corticosteroid use or use switching to a product that is non-steroidal uh, that maybe needs to be used every day. Flares, you always kind of go back and reset. Remember with asthma, what we would do is we would gear up and treat a flare and then we would back back down. Same thing here. So a flare is like start over. Here you could use an oral. If you've got acute exacerbations that are not responding to topical, then using a short course of an oral steroid would be uh, appropriate. On the next page, in, think infections are possible because you've got a lot of the breakdown of the skin barrier. So bacterial infections are possible and staph's going to be your big nemesis there. Uh, so using mucuricin, that is a 2% uh, very good anti-staph uh, ointment. So think about it for when you've got topical type of infections that you're worried about. For viral infections, herpes simplex seems to be the most problem. You can use an, um, an antiviral in those cases. In antifungals, they recommend either you can go either topical or oral. I would say if you can go topical, that's better. Uh, because the, the orals are going to have the big interactions and the more uh, systemic side effects. Prevention, skin barrier enhancement. So don't forget those emollients. Okay, questions about those? Contact dermatitis. So localized usually can tell somebody's been in contact with something. It's usually well demarcated. The ones I tended to see the most were look like this. I always asked about latex allergies. You know, if you had your hands in a glove that had latex, that's about 10% of the population. But often they'll come in with this very complaint. I saw a lot of hands that look like this in older people. Um, So using a, it's, it's mostly going to be what figuring, if they can figure out what it is, avoidance is, is helpful, the emollients, and using a potent corticosteroid for a few, a couple of weeks until you can get it under control. And then avoiding whatever it is that is leading to that is the, is the best approach. Okay, um, time is short. Okay, I'm just going to cover uh, chronic hand eczema, and what I'll do is I'll put poison ivy to next week. Even though it's in this category, um, I think it, it is different enough, it's got enough different products that it'll be too new to talk about. Have y'all done poison ivy? You, did, you talked about poison ivy and contact dermatitis. But it's different. Poison ivy is I mean, the treatment is different. Did you talk about specific treatment for poison ivy? No. Okay, we'll go over that next week. The chronic hand eczema. So this one is lots of irritants. So the chemical irritants, whatever people are working with, uh, maybe in their work, uh, hand soaps uh, that they could be coming into contact with. 
So let's go under skin protection. Here it's, it's, it's uh, using more than just barriers, but uh, using protective equipment, uh, depending on what they're coming into contact with, like gloves uh, or other products that, that may be available at their work. Maybe they're not using them. Um, cotton gloves. Did you all talk about that, the use of cotton gloves inside other gloves? So you can get cotton liners, and sometimes those are helpful if people are having reactions to like rubber gloves, latex gloves you can replace with other types. Uh, but you can get cotton sleeves that then can go in that, and sometimes those are more protecting. They, they don't cause the skin to sweat as much and they're absorbent. Um, so think about the cotton, and they're, and they're fairly inexpensive. And they can be washed and reused. Okay, so moisturizer and skin barrier repair creams. Let's look at that at the back, bottom of that. Um, so these are products that actually improve the epithelium, and they're a little bit different. Um, if you look under the, at the very last uh, bullet, is they will have, uh, they'll, they're even called skin barrier repair creams. They'll have those ceramides in them, fatty acids or cholesterol as part of the ingredients. If you look on the next page, um, I thought I gave you some examples. Yes, so water repellent barrier protectant creams include North 201, uh, there's another one, the SBS 44, Caratex 71, these are not very common. Uh, so you may have to, to search, or people may have to order them online. Dermashield is another really good one. Uh, it's um, marketed both as the barrier protectant, it's an oil and water base. That is a good one. For patients with mild to moderate disease, you're going to use a higher end uh, potency steroid, so the one to three. So one is which one? Group one is clobetasol. What's group two? Hello. So same thing. Reduce, induce the remission. Put them on intermittent. Um, again, the alternatives are there's calcineurin inhibitors. And then phototherapy is is uh, mentioned throughout here for a lot of the diseases. Again, that. Um, that is done through a dermatologist, and then your secondary bacterial infections. So a lot of them are similar, so I would really look for the differences in the, the different uh, eczemas and dermatitis that we talked about. Anything different there that you didn't hear before?